Hi there, it's Alex here. 2022 is finally over and behind us, which means that we get to take a look back at some of the best and most importantly, some of our favorites of the year and share why you, yes you, the person watching this, why you should go and watch these amazing shows. And before we go right into it, I just want to break down real quick that this video will be kind of like last year. It's going to be me and a few friends talking about some of our favorites. Now I'll go ahead and start us off with my favorite of the year. I never got around to saying it, but The Suicide Squad ended up being my favorite movie back in 2021. If you take a dive back on my channel, you know that I really love James Gunn, especially his work on the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. So his fun and twisted yet weird as hell take on The Suicide Squad was all I could ever ask for. And I truly mean that. This movie was beyond perfect to me. It's like somebody snuck into my house while I was sleeping, put a machine inside of my head, and said, what would Alex love in a movie? And then they just put it in a movie for two hours, and I ate it all up. It was perfect. So with that being said, the idea of Peacemaker having his own show really had me intrigued. Because out of all these colorful characters, it's odd that you wanted to vote an entire spinoff on this one specific guy. Not to say Peacemaker is bad, but I just think it's an interesting choice. And yet, this really ended up surpassing my expectations. From the moment I saw the opening credits, which might be the best in television history, I knew we were in good hands. Peacemaker really surprised me in so many ways. The biggest one being that John Cena, when given good material and good direction, is a really good actor. Because typically, I can find him annoying in most projects. Except for in Bumblebee, because they gave him the best line of the franchise, and because of that, I'm going to give him a pass. They literally call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't set off any red flags? Enough! But here, while he's somehow at his most unhinged, it also allows for a more understanding character, a more believable performance. It's still very much steered under the control of Gunn's writing, but it's seen as delivering energy, which helps stuck the landing for most of these lines, allowing them to succeed instead of falling flat. And while Peacemaker is at center stage, this show is an ensemble. I can't say this is my favorite group of characters, I still much prefer the Guardians and the Suicide Squad over this, but still very much enjoying my time with them. Some true standouts here that I really can't wait to see more of these actors go on to do better projects. So yeah, Peacemaker, definitely check it out if you haven't already. I think it's worth your time. Now that I've gotten mine out of the way, I want to go ahead and hand you off to my friend Robert from Rob's Thoughts and Sipop.com. He's going to talk about the rehearsal on HBO. Take it away, Rob. Hey Alex, thanks for having me back on the channel again. I want to talk about the rehearsal because even though movies are more my speed and I didn't watch a whole lot of TV this year, the rehearsal was easily far and away the best show that I saw in 2022. I jumped onto the Nathan For You train late since it was already completed and on HBO Max before I had the chance to watch it, but that show immediately put me in a place where I'd watch anything Nathan Fielder did going forward. His ability to be a total asshole to his marks at times while still being endearing is a hallmark of his whole thing and is taken to a whole new level in the rehearsal. So much so that asshole doesn't even really describe it anymore. Maniacal or so sociopathic would almost work better. But again, it's that endearing quality, that empathy, that compassion for people that ultimately shines through. I don't want to spoil much of this because while I thankfully saw a good chunk of people talking about it online during its run, it seems to have dissipated pretty quickly and I still want people to discover and to watch it. So what I will say is that it starts off as something very specific and pretty quickly zags and goes in a different direction. In the first episode, Fielder helps a guy named Kor rehearse what it would be like to expose his own lie to his group of friends in painstaking detail. He recreates the man's apartment in an entire New York City bar and he goes to wild lengths to hide the fact that he'll be, unbeknownst to Kor, helping him cheat at trivia. It's a perfect hook for a show, and a great first episode that makes you think the rest of the show will be one-off rehearsals, the way Nathan For You had one-off episodes about different businesses. But in the second episode, while it starts off seeming like just another rehearsal, it becomes so much more, and the central storyline of the rest of the show. Nathan sets up what amounts to a dream home in rural Oregon for a woman in her mid-40s named Angela, so she can learn what it's like to raise a child from a newborn to the age of 18. Only problem is, she wants to do this when she's married, and thanks to not having a man to accompany her in this part of her journey, Nathan ends up stepping up as a platonic co-parent, and from there, it gets really meta. Eventually, Angela's rehearsal and Nathan's obligations to other rehearsals overlap, and we get a story and season of television I couldn't look away from and couldn't stop thinking of between each episode. This is particularly true for episode 4, The Fielder Method, in which you start to question not only the reality of this show, but the presence of truth, honesty, and reality in the real, everyday world. 
You wonder how much of the show is true, and by extension, you wonder if we as people can ever find truth. How much can we really know other people, and or anticipate what they will do in a given situation? Is trying to understand people ultimately futile, or is the process worth it despite the likely frustrating outcome? We slowly watch this all unravel and see Fielder understanding himself through the process of making the show. By extension, we can begin to understand him, others, and ourselves. But at the same time, all of those things become more and more of an enigma. If we can't ever know other people, what, if any, kind of responsibility do we have towards them? Is honesty always necessary? Are there times when we can be crossing a line due to dishonesty? These are the kind of questions that keep you up at night. And while also breaking down the reality TV format, Fielder is asking these questions. I don't know if he has the answers, and I don't think it really matters if he does. Bringing them up in the first place in this kind of format is almost enough in a way. It might be a weird comparison, but kind of like last year's Bo Burnham Inside, I don't ever want to see behind the scenes material for the rehearsal, or read any interviews from Nathan or the participants about how it's pulled off. It's mystery and frankly overwhelming sense of wonder at how he pulls all of this off is the majority of what makes the show great. You wonder just how much Angela knew what she was getting into. You wonder what all of the other dozens if not hundreds of hired actors knew. How was it filmed? Were there loosely scripted scenes or were the cameras just always on? Was it Nathan's plan all along to be a part of the rehearsal with Angela? I'm asking you all these questions, but I genuinely don't want to know the answers, because that I'm asking him in the first place is what speaks to the show's quality. I was watching each one of these episodes at 11pm as soon as they premiered every single week. It was a magnet drawing me in as soon as it loaded on the HBO app. I was loving each episode and was having my mind blown, and I just needed to see as soon as I could whether Nathan would be able to one-up himself with a new episode, as he had the previous week. And at the end of the six-episode run, I think he had. Its finale was in August, and I think I've seen it all the way through three times now, and I've watched singular episodes here and there as well. The Fielder Method episode is a particular highlight. Each new development in that episode just keeps me shaking my head in wonder. So yeah, you have to go watch the rehearsal if you haven't already. If you have, then go watch it again. I can feel safe recommending it to just about everyone. It's crazy and unlike any show you've seen before, but there's an angle in there for you no matter what you're looking for in a television show. Amazing stuff, Robert. I highly agree. The rehearsal is one of the best shows of the year. I really loved it. I got to talk about it a little bit whenever I covered the first episode of House of the Dragon before I knew I was going to drop off of that show. Um, but the rehearsal is really fantastic, especially if you love stuff like Nathan for You can't recommend it enough and moving forward from aaron schweitzer a good buddy of mine he does the sip pops writers room podcast still he's gonna be talking about under the banner heaven a limited series on fx and hulu i'm hearing a lot of good things and he's gonna tell you why you should go check it out well hi there i'm aaron i'm an editor at sifpop.com and i'm also the host of the sip pop writers room podcast and alex reached out to me and he wanted me to tell you about my favorite TV show of 2022, which is FX and Hulu's collaboration for Under the Banner of Heaven. I really love this show and I love it for one specific reason. I mean, there's plenty of reasons to love this show, but the thing that elevates it to me above everything else is one specific reason. And it's not a spoiler to say this, but I am going to kind of reveal what the show does. So the show starts off as being presented as a murder mystery uh, based off of a true story, by the way. Uh, it it kind of starts off as a murder mystery, but then it winds up actually devolving into not just being about who done it, but it winds up being a little bit more of like you kind of know who did it pretty quickly on, but it, it winds up being a criticism of modern radical Christianity. And as somebody who does identify as a Christian, as somebody who's even an ordained minister, it's one of those things that has been easy to detect for me over the last several years, specifically throughout the COVID pandemic and the Trump presidency of just seeing the way that Christians have chosen to react um, radically in one direction or the other. But specifically, um, it, this show asks the question of what if, what happens when you take your faith um, to a radical extreme and it, in not good ways. So um, this show really explores uh, the heart of when, when Christians do bad things in the name of God, but that aren't actually from God. And I think... That's a really interesting premise to deal with. Now, it's led by Andrew Garfield, who is giving an incredible performance. I also want to shout out uh, Sam Worthington, who was one of those people that I was like, I don't think he can really act, can he? And then he shows up in this show and it's like, yeah, absolutely he can. Daisy Edgar Jones is a relatively new person to the scene, but she has made her mark. Uh, and this is certainly no exception. Uh, Wyatt Russell, who has been in other things as recently as Falcon and the Winter Soldier, playing the U.S. soldier. He's in this and he's giving a great performance, um, plenty of other people that maybe even have small roles. Um, but also the other two that I wanted to highlight were um, Gil Birmingham and Rory Culkin, um, both having uh, great performances. I loved, loved, loved them. Um, ultimately, Old Under the Banner of Heaven is a, film, is a show that I think is excellently made um, in terms of its cinematography, its 
um, sound, its pacing specifically, the things that it that it does where it really feels like the writers were trying to show respect for what happened, but also trying to have a, a really good biting social commentary on something that I think is is one of those that is also done respectfully. Again, I feel like it's pretty easy to bash on church people at this point in time, but as a church person, there is definitely moments where I'm like, hey, not all of us are like that, or I'm not like that, or this really isn't fair to church culture in general, only to this particular population, or this particular subset or whatever. And I think this film, or this show rather, just really, really highlights um, what I think is an important message uh, in that people can do wrong things for wrong reasons in the name of what is supposed to be good. Um, and there are massive consequences for that, especially to people who still identify as followers of that same good. If you haven't checked it out, I really hope you check it out. It's on Hulu, FX on Hulu, and uh, it is to me the best show of the year with the best performance with Andrew Garfield leading. That's my time and hopefully I'll see you guys next year. Thank you for dropping by, Aaron. I really appreciate whenever you come by and stop on the channel. Glad you got to talk about Under the Banner of Heaven. It looks like a fantastic show and, and hopefully I can work it into my schedule at some point. So I kind of lied to you guys. I said earlier that Peacemaker was my favorite show of 2022. And for the longest time, it was. And then this final season came out, and it was amazing. And the only reason I didn't talk about it is because, well, I already talked a bunch about it on my channel. But I really want to reiterate how amazing this show is. And I'm so glad to have newcomer Shane Kanto from the Wasteland Reviewer. He's going to drop by and tell you why you should be watching Better Call Saul, and why the final season is one of the best in television history. It's time to talk about the last season of one of the best shows on television, period, Better Call Saul, season six. And this was a show that started as a spinoff of Breaking Bad, arguably one of the greatest shows of all time, that people were like, but who asked for this? But why? And then people started to slowly realize it was the show that they always needed, but never knew that fact. And this show coming into its last season has been building tension, building tension for season after season. And this year we got two parts of its final season, including the first part, which really hones in and focuses on Saul and Kim trying to take down Howard, who they've been in conflict for years. And this first half deals with some impressive payoffs from the character of Nacho and Howard. And it drops you off with one of the most shocking mid-season finales that you'll probably see, period. Who are you? I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. And as we return back, we expect there's Lalo Salamaca for us to resolve with. And the show seems pretty well resolved until we get to the final couple of episodes, which are shocking in how they reform everything about this show as we see into the future where Saul is in a whole new life and he can't quite get rid of that grifting criminal just taste and falls right back into things as we lead up to one of the best finales that you're going to see in television as a wonderful parallel and honestly foil to Breaking Bad, which slowly sees Walter White become a monster and spiral to that point. And this show gives us the arc of Jimmy McGill becoming Jimmy again and putting Saul Goodman away forever. And this is one of the best acted shows around Bob Odenkirk and Rhea Seahorn deserve all the praise that they get for the amazing performances that they give. You have Giancarlo Esposito, Tony Dalton, and everybody else in this show 
who give such impressive performances. You have Vince Gilligan, who knows how to structure a story long term, how to deliver payoffs. You could even just look at the IMDb of this season, where half the episodes are 9.0s or above, and you have a couple 9.8s and 9.9s here. This is a show that is so impressive in its storytelling, in the way that it gets you to invest in so many different things. You invest in horrible jokes and pranks and different plans and grifts that Jimmy puts together over time as we see him and Kim spiral together and become horrible people and then have to dig themselves out of it. And just the final couple episodes of this season tell such an impressive story. Those couple episodes are better than most television shows as a whole, period. This show is going to be sorely missed. It is incredibly well acted, incredibly well directed. The writing in this show is deep, thematic, and impeccably structured where they're laying down groundwork for season upon season and it all comes to a head here this is one of the best spin-offs prequels that you're ever going to see this story proved itself to be must-see television and it's definitely one of the best shows on television in 2022 and i know speaking for myself I'm going to miss Better Call Saul, and this is honestly one of the best shows I think I've ever watched. We did it! We did a Best Shows of 2022 video! I had so much fun editing this. I love it every time I get to work with my friends. Thank you guys again for dropping by and giving me some time. I, I love it whenever we get to work on stuff like this. Um, check out all of them. I've left uh, where you can find them on the screens. And as well as some links to their, if they got a YouTube channel, definitely link that down below and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, another year, another completed list. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope 2023 holds some good things. I really, really hope it does this time. Um, hope you're having a fantastic day. Have a fantastic year. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. Alex out.